this day, um, we have not received justice. We still have not gone to trial. We are still waiting all these years for justice for my dad. Gloria Talley, missing out of Albuquerque, 1986. Brian Nelson. Farmington 2019, Papita Red Hair, Albuquerque 2020. Every time I look at her pictures, I ask her, why, who did this to you? I never ever imagined myself as a mom to go looking for my child and being told that he was murdered. That was the last time I seen her, the last time I spoke with her. I know I'm not the only one telling my story. There's more, many more out there who are afraid to get out. More than 5,700 people missing from indigenous communities across the country. It's a fact many didn't know until the 2021 disappearance and death of Gabby Petito as she disappeared while traveling the country with her boyfriend. The media attention on that case sparked an outcry a call for attention to the other missing person cases, namely the shocking number of people of color who have vanished, their families desperate for help and answers about what happened to them. I'm Royal Day. In New Mexico and across the Navajo Nation and our state's Pueblos, there are around 1,000 missing indigenous people. That's according to the Attorney General. They are daughters, wives and mothers, as well as fathers, sons and husbands. The red handprint, now a symbol of advocacy to find them. And for somebody to put it on their face is kind of symbolic to being their voices, um, speaking out for, for those who cannot no longer speak out or um, those whose voices have been silenced. These are the stories of the missing and the murder, the people working on their behalf and the call to help bring closure to their families. This is Outcry, the search for answers. The Albuquerque FBI's oldest missing indigenous persons case is Antoinette Cayadito. She vanished 36 years ago, taken from her Gallup home. Antoinette and her sisters went to bed together on April 6th, 1986. And when they woke up, the nine-year-old was gone. We went knocking door to door in our pajamas. She said she couldn't find Antoinette. We were getting ready for um, church. It was a Sunday morning. I guess that's the hardest part, not knowing, um, not having, not having that closure. Today, Antoinette would be in her 40s. This is a photo of what investigators believe she would look like now. Her family just wants to know if she's safe and what she's doing today. The FBI unveiled a new tool this year to try and bring closure to the families of the missing. It's a database updated monthly when the agency gets information about missing indigenous people from New Mexico, its Pueblos, as well as the Navajo Nation. FBI agents say this is a resource for law enforcement agencies to investigate and research these cases and all of it's found in one place. Our data was the, what we noticed was the biggest issue and concern. The data was incomplete in many places, and some agencies were reporting different data, no fault of their own, but just in different ways. The agency trains law enforcement on how to use the system so neighboring organizations can have that same information. If families don't find their missing loved one on the list, the FBI says to contact their local law enforcement agency. The crisis of missing and murdered indigenous people has been described as an epidemic and families say they are left with little help to find their loved ones. Anchor Sasha Leninger talked with a family still waiting to hear from their daughter after more than two years. Papita Redhair was dropped off at her boyfriend's house one night in March of 2020 in Albuquerque, South Valley. Her mother and two other family members in the car with her. Three days go by and no one has heard from the 27 year old. Her mother says that was unusual. On a Friday, the 27th, I tried calling her. I tried texting her and my intuition right away told me something was wrong. And I tried Monday on the 30th again. I tried texting her. That's when her phone was stolen. The person with Pepita's phone said they bought it from someone. Since that day, the family has put out flyers on streets and buses and looked throughout the city for their daughter. Solving cases like this is no easy task. I talked with law enforcement about the roadblocks they face when solving indigenous cases. I think there's still kind of a misconception on Navajo that there is, you know, a lot of women and children missing, but you know, it's equal. So, you know, males are also people that are missing quite a bit. New Mexico having 
right around 10% of, of its population being Native American, but a majority of the murdered or missing cases are uh, of Native Americans, you know, there's a big disparity there. Captain Troy Velasquez was on the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Task Force at its inception back in 2019. He says one major issue they faced. COVID-19 came about and that kind of put a stop to a lot of in-person meetings. So all these in-person meetings that were taking place were put to a put to a hold and and everything went basically virtual. Slowing the research needed to solve the cases. Another issue, jurisdiction. We only have so much we can do. We have authority uh, to basically charge people in the tribal court. Um, so when it comes to major cases, when it comes to homicide or kidnapping or those kind of things, uh, FBI has to get involved. That's because tribal land is considered federal land. Another major problem law enforcement faces, reporting issues. Everybody has their own um, you know, information systems uh, that they do the reports on and they don't connect. I remember a number coming out initially about there being 10 cases that were active missing uh, Native American cases back in 2019 that were active, but we knew the numbers were much larger. So you can pull up, you know, a missing person has his NCI number. You have to go to that jurisdiction, say if Farmington has a missing person, you have to go to them, get that report to get the backstory. NCIC is the National Crime Information Center, a database of information gathered by officers. It can be accessed by all departments across the country. Regina Chacon oversees the New Mexico area. The initial call is very important. Law enforcement, they're, they're boots on the ground. They're trying to get as much information. A major improvement has been made when filing missing persons reports. Law enforcement can now add tribal affiliation to a NCIC report. New Mexico, the first state in the country to have this option. It was in June of 2022. We had um, 51 entries into the tribal affiliation field. And what we've noticed is there were 35 um, that had tribal affiliation that were associated with the missing persons entries. Tribal affiliation now mandatory in all those forms. One tool law enforcement is using to try and get information in these cases is rewards. The FBI is now offering a $5,000 reward for information on the disappearance of Ella Mae Begay. Begay was last seen near Sweetwater, Arizona in June of last year. She left her home in a gray F-150. Officials believe the truck may have been traveling between Gallup and Grants, then on to Albuquerque. The gays loved ones are so frustrated. They feel alone in their search for her. As KOT's Brianna Albizu found out, this is a common theme in these searches. It's been over a year since Rennell Rose Bennett was last seen here on the Navajo Nation. And with each passing day comes a growing fear among loved ones. Her mother, Rose Yazzie, says she hasn't seen Bennett since June 15, 2021, adding that she was supposed to attend her own daughter's birthday just days before in Farmington, but she never made it despite the hopes of her only daughter. Her daughter kept texting her mom, remember it's my birthday today. And she kept looking out to the road and she kept wanting to see her mom. Yazi says she spoke with a police officer and filed a missing persons report on June 21st at the Shiprock Police Department. However, she says the report wasn't found in the department's system until days after. From then on, Yazi claims answers from police were far and few between. So over a year later, where does Bennett's investigation stand? I'll have that answer coming up in just a few minutes. Royal. While not all cases are the same, investigators believe many include a history of sexual assaults and violence. About 56% of the state's indigenous population will experience these crimes, according to the UNM Center for Social Policy. Advocates in indigenous communities say they need more support and victims need better resources. They believe families need to be trained to spot the trouble signs of a toxic relationship that could lead to violence. It's going to be hard and it's going to be tough, but we are here to stand with you. We're in solidarity with you and we got your back. If you or someone you know is struggling, help is available. There are plenty of resources and we have links to them at KOAT.com. This crisis is about finding women, but also the many indigenous men who've also vanished. As Stephanie Muniz reports, more than half of the indigenous people in the missing persons registry are Native American men.
That's right, Royal. Hundreds of indigenous men go missing each year in New Mexico, and that's the case for Zachariah Juwan Shorty. He was 23 years old when he went missing from Farmington in 2020. His mom, Vanjie Randall Shorty, searched for him at the motel he was last seen at, talked to friends, and knocked on doors for any information. Feeling hopeless, finally, police told her they found his body, but couldn't tell her when or where. She was in the dark until she received his death certificate. I found out the place he was found by going to Nanonzad and going from house to house on my own. And I never ever imagined myself as a mom to go looking for my child and being told that he was murdered. Frustrated and feeling alone, Vanji continued to push for answers. Coming up, I'll tell you how she received support from other families struggling with this issue and law enforcement. Community members joining the search for answers. It's a cycle, and I know that we all say that we need to break that cycle. I mean, but where, where do we start? This group helping families who feel compelled to go out on their own and look for their loved one and using old tools in new ways. Why this approach may be the key to solving these cases. Indigenous people are not looked at as important. So with these cases now, it's difficult to get that coverage to get that immediate response. This is something that we have to do as a community, as indigenous people, we are there to stand up for one another. To, to let them know that they, they're not going to be alone in this. Supporting those left behind. For many years, families say they felt like they were carrying these burdens alone. But now the community is rallying behind them. Filmmakers are bringing attention to this crisis. Support groups are showing up online. And hundreds are gathering for rallies to raise awareness. You're on the road hours at a time, miles at a time. and you just have a chance to reflect and think about where you've been, where you're going. That was John Sosi. He is the founder of a group called Walking the Healing Path. Their mission is to teach others to stop the cycle of violence in indigenous communities. The group has walked more than 2,500 miles with that message. Support like this is helping families who are still looking for their missing indigenous family member. Brianna Albizu has more from the family of Renell Rose Bennett. Three months after Renelle Rose Bennett went missing in June 2021, family members found a sweater and her shoes just in the north area of Shiprock here, but nothing since. The vital find was all thanks to Gerald Harrison, Bennett's brother. He often spends his days and nights searching for his sister. Before she went missing, Harrison used to live in Colorado. He then moved back to Shiprock to help with search efforts, a task law enforcement agencies just aren't doing check on tips or where, wherever the, uh, somebody calls, say, I think we've seen her here, or check if you check this place, and, and I will leave and I'll go. Harrison said he searched all over Shiprock just to find his sister. While the task can be overwhelming, he knows it has to be done as the only brother and protector of his family. Bennett's disappearance not only affecting her family, but her kids as well. I'll tell you about how they're keeping their hope alive coming up in just a few. Royal. Dealing with the mystery of missing indigenous people is something generations of families have had to deal with. This is Rain, also known as Rain Bear Stands Last. He remembers hearing about these cases since he was young. And since 2017, he's directed six documentaries highlighting this epidemic. When you're offered really a responsibility like that, um, then you have to take it. Let's continue to highlight the cases of some of the missing and murdered. Stephanie Muniz tells us about a young indigenous man whose body was found in a field more than two years ago. After losing her son, Zachariah Juwan Shorty, Vanji Randall Shorty has continued to push for answers. Finally, she got help from law enforcement. We're finally being heard. 
we are finally being heard. In February 2021, the FBI began offering a $5,000 reward for any information on his death. All the FBI knew at the time was that Shorty was killed with a gun. A year later, in January 2022, the reward was raised to $10,000. In the meantime, his mother, Vanji, spent time in Albuquerque trying to get the attention of the Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, at a rally. We want to show her that we are still here as a family and that, you know, we want we want our loved ones, you know, we want justice for them. We want our missing found. As awareness grows, so does Vanjie's hope. She's been in communication with the head of the FBI here in New Mexico. Now we know it takes time for missing persons cases to get solved, but one person that has a personal connection to the issue is using technology to get the word out. Social media can get information out in an instant. That's the goal of the Navajo Nation Missing Persons page. So many of us were kind of on that back burner. We were afraid to talk, but now it's like, get out of the way because here we come. Mesky is no stranger to the mark left by the missing murdered indigenous people crisis. Before I was even born, my both my grandfathers were murdered and that has affected my family, even though I never got to meet them. When she was a young girl, her mother's husband was found brutally murdered while her family lived in Oklahoma. You know, I never thought years later that, that this would you know, be something that I'd have to deal with again. For so many Native Americans, trauma is passed down from generations. It's a cycle, and I know that we all say that we need to break that cycle. I mean, but where, where do we start? The Navajo Nation is the largest reservation in the U.S., and even then, some missing cases never make the news. They'll write a little story about it, you know, but that's pretty much all the highlights we get. And if that's all we got, that's where we turn to social media. On Facebook, Mesky has over 20,000 followers. Beyond that, she organizes events and attends rallies with others, like this 13-year U.S. Army veteran. I came home, you know, wanting to do something, wanting to give back, you know, to have a purpose. And at the same time, also healing. Regardless of how difficult it could be, these advocates push on. This is something that we have to do as a community, as indigenous people, we are there to stand up for one another. One family has reached the masses. Their work has created awareness about the missing and murdered crisis across this country. We told you earlier about Ella Mabegay, a 62 year old who disappeared from her Sweetwater home in June of 2021. Her loved ones walked to Washington, D.C. so other communities could hear Ella's story. Seraphine Warren is Ella's niece. She started with a walk of 75 miles to the Navajo Nation in Window Rock. She was then compelled to finish the 2,000 mile trek to the nation's capital. The journey took about eight months. I was frustrated just, just because there was no help after the two weeks the Navajo Police Department and everybody left. Um, we had no directions, there was no update. Seraphine finished in early October. She met with Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, to discuss the need for change in how these cases are handled. So many families say they're frustrated with how law enforcement is handling their cases. Here's KOAT's Sasha Leninger. A daughter missing after being dropped off at her boyfriend's Albuquerque home more than two years ago. Her family desperate to hear from her. I have hopes that I would see her. She would just come back in and come home, walk in and say, Mom, I'm home. We're hoping for that. Pepita Redhair's family drove with her that day from Crown Point, taking her to a home near 114th and Central. It's a trip she's made many times before, but this time it was different. And after not hearing from her daughter for three days, King knew something was wrong. Since that day, Pepita has not been found. Still to come, a look at how Pepita's family is continuing to search for answers. As families push for more help, they do feel like some of what they have to say is being heard. I'm happy with the fact that they are listening and um, it's on a personal level now and they're collaborating finally. They're our voices are being heard. The changes law enforcement has made now that more attention has been brought to the missing and the murdered movement. The 
families I've worked with, they have hope that they will find answers on their loved ones who are missing. They want that closure, they want justice. like murals is one of the ways to bring awareness to the nationwide problem of missing and murdered indigenous people. This mural behind me created by an artist we featured before, Skindian Art, and their commitment to this issue is prevalent. Looking at the figure's mouth, it clearly shows a painted red hand over the mouth, an image that's become a symbol. This movement is gaining more momentum each day, and because of that, you'll see images like this more and more in our community. It has been two long years since the family of Pepita Redhair have seen their daughter after dropping her off at her boyfriend's house in Albuquerque, South Valley. The family has passed out posters and worked with police departments to try and get leads. They say they're frustrated that nothing has come of it. Today, King is active in missing and murdered indigenous events, even organizing her own rally in 2021 to try and raise awareness of her daughter's case. Oh, we want my daughters, my family, want closure. <laughs> The Crime Stoppers is now offering a reward of up to $2,000 for any information in Pepita Red Hair's case. Reaching people in their native language is a tool law enforcement is just beginning to explore. The FBI is now putting up posters and recording public service announcements in Navajo. The department has a Navajo translator in their Salt Lake City office. They've been working hard to create these posters and record these ads in Navajo. Their goal is to get information out to everyone on tribal land. Indigenous families say they're the driving force of every case. Brianna Albizu talked with the family of Renell Rose Bennett. Renell is a mother who's been gone for more than a year. Since June 2021, the search for Renell Rose Bennett hasn't been easy, least of all for her own family. Janelle is the sister of Bennett. She says her missing case has had the worst impact on children within the family, including her son. But the sorrow hits hardest for Bennett's own children, a son and a daughter, both under the age of 15. They'll get sad. They'll just sit there. And we always, you know, we always try to keep them happy. Try to keep, you know, mom being away off their minds. Just several weeks ago, her mom and sister were both seen at the first ever Missing in New Mexico Day event held in Albuquerque, and they were speaking to multiple law enforcement officials, including special agent in charge Raul Bohanda with the FBI. Royal. Thank you, Brianna. That event, Missing Persons Day, is part of the push to change how these cases are handled. The event brought mourning families together in one place with law enforcement and lawmakers. It was one of the goals set by the New Mexico Missing Murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives Task Force. Well, families were for many years and decades frustrated by the lack of action from law enforcement. And so events like today, it's an important step at building trust. While the attorney general estimates there are around 1,000 missing indigenous people in New Mexico, the new FBI database only lists around 200. It's an issue they're working to fix. The database is expected to be key in helping with this crisis. And as that issue is being worked on, families say they've learned a lot on their own about how to search for a loved one. Stephanie Muniz has that story. As the search for answers continues, Vanjie Randall Shorty attended the Missing in New Mexico Day. There, she tried to gain some clarity about her son's case. She was able to meet with the FBI face to face. I'm happy with the fact that they are listening and um, it's on a personal level now. We just work together. Just an overall promise that we're going to continue to work together, keep them informed, and, uh, and then we're looking. Vanjie says she hopes whoever was involved with her son's murder are held accountable. Vanjie tells me families dealing with the missing loved one are united. And as she continues to advocate, her voice continues to get louder. Recently, she was appointed to head the Farmington Bureau of the New Mexico Crusaders for Justice to help families just like hers. 
When a loved one is missing, what happens in those first hours can make a difference in how quickly they're found. A common misconception is that you must wait to report someone missing, but those first 72 hours are really key. Albuquerque police say gathering information about a missing person right away can help law enforcement a lot. But the big things are, you know, what are they wearing? What, what do they have with them? Do they have a cell phone with them? Do they have their debit cards with them? Um, and then kind of pattern of life for us. Where, what, what, what makes them comfortable? Where do they like to go? Where, where, where would you find them if you were searching for them? The National Indigenous Women's Resource Center has a booklet and a free internet download on what to do if a loved one goes missing. Some key points. When you make a missing persons report, ask for the officer's name and badge number. Keep that with the police report number so you can follow up. And of course, keep looking safely. New Mexico's efforts to find missing indigenous people or to figure out who has murdered Native American men and women is just starting. Many organizations have been pushing for help for decades, and just now it seems authorities and policymakers are listening. Again, an example of this progress, Missing and Murdered Persons Day. Seeing how many people showed up for this and how much is going on and how much the government is being involved is, is giving me so much hope because we don't really have that out there. But advocates and families say there's still so much more to be done. In New Mexico, a task force dedicated to this crisis says it's working to change laws and get more money to the people who are still searching. Thank you for joining us. There are many challenges for everyone involved in this missing and murdered indigenous crisis. The one thing we hear over and over again in our reporting is families need more help. As the outcry for answers continues, we will keep sharing their stories as they push for justice. Good night.